can't sleep, Mandy confessed. He was supposed to be home an hour ago, and he's still not here. Her husband, Joe, rolled over in bed, kind of half concerned, half tired, half angry. It'll be all right. He'll be here soon. And he was back to sleep in a heartbeat. That frustrated Mandy even more. For another hour, she tossed and turned, waiting for her son, Kyle, to get home because his curfew was a lot earlier. She also hated the fact that her husband, Joe, seemed to not care. He said things like, oh, the Lord will provide, and, uh, you know, Kyle's, you know, Kyle's in high school. He's a responsible young man, and, and she didn't like to hear those words. It just made it seem like he didn't give a rip. An hour later, she heard the door unlock and close, and her son Kyle's 11, size 11 and a half vans plodding down the hallway. She bolted out of the bedroom, ready to scold him, but also wanting to hug him because he was home and he was safe. And before she could do anything, he confessed, Mom, I'm so sorry. My phone died. I think I need a new one. And so we were out, and I was, you know, trying to get home, and then my friend Noah's car died, and so I had to give Noah a ride to his car, and we did, and then I was giving him a ride back to his house, and his girlfriend realized that she left her ID at the movie theater, and so we went back to get her ID at the movie theater, and then when we dropped her off at her house, her mom was up late and wanted to serve us her famous taco pizza, and so we had that, but I came straight home from there, Mom, I'm so sorry. Ah! <sighs> She groaned, just be ready for 9.30 church tomorrow. Five hours later, Joe's alarm, beep, beep, beep. He snoozes a few times, eventually gets up, makes some French roast coffee, scrolls through his phone, goes back for more coffee, looks at the clock on the coffee maker, and it screams at him, 9.06 a.m., oh! He hollers down the hallway, everyone get up, we're going to be late for church. No response. He goes into the bedroom. Hun, hun, it's late. We're going to be late for church. Get up. And Mandy rolls over. Oh, what time is it? He says, 10 after 9. Oh, Joe, she says, not again. She bolts out of bed into the bathroom, takes a cold shower, burns her forehead with her curling iron. They all get in the car. Joe drives like Dale Earnhardt Jr. to church down Kelly Lane. They get there at 9.38 a.m. during the second song, and they're ready for worship. Or are they? I think if that were a real story, and we'd have Joe and Mandy and Kyle here, right, and... and and it was like three weeks later, and they'd be sitting up here, and I'd say, so is that what happened there? You know, does that reflect your, your faith and your love and the desires in your heart for, for Jesus and, and his faithfulness and his love to you? Does that, does that really reflect that? And they would be honest, and they would say, no, that doesn't really, we don't want it to shake out like that. So what happened there? You know, what, what went wrong in that situation? What, what could they have done better? We're going to talk about that today as we talk about really what I think it boils down to, and that's family communication. Like communication could have helped in that whole thing, from the girlfriend losing her ID to, to you know, uh, uh, Kyle's phone dying. Well, he should have used someone else's phone, right? You're thinking so. All kinds of communication. He should have communicated with his parents. They need to communicate with each other. Family communication. And so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to go in God's Word in Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to show you some family communication from the family of Jesus. I'm also going to show you in Luke chapter 2 the very first words of Jesus that he spoke that are recorded in the Bible. Okay, so he spoke a lot of words when he was a toddler and an eight-year-old, but we don't have his words recorded until this very incident that we're going to read today. It's the very first time that the Bible records words of Jesus are here, and we'll cover that today. So we'll see communication in Jesus' family, his first words, and actually some miscommunication and communication blunders in Jesus' family and see how they respond to them. And we're going to find some grace and guidance for our own lives as we watch this and see how it unfolds. Okay, so that's communication in Jesus' family. So um, let's get started. We're in Luke chapter 2, 
Uh, I'm going to read verses 41 and 42. Every year, Jesus' parents, that's Joseph and Mary, went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. So a few, few things here. First of all, the first two words. Every year, and then the last few words, according to the custom. This is a healthy habit for Jesus' family. They did it regularly. They did it all the time. So whenever it was Passover festival, they'd go to church. How often was Passover festival? Once a week? Nope. Once a month? Nope. Once a year? Yep. They attended 100% of the time of the Passover festival every year. And how far was the trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem? Anyone know? As far as it is from Austin to San Antonio, 75 miles, 79 to be exact. That's the trip. And they didn't hop in their Tesla. They walk. I drive to San Antonio about three times a year, and every time I drive, I'm like, this is far. Uh, and they walked 70, the 75 mile trip to Jerusalem. And though we don't have it specifically here in the Bible, um, we have some behavior of Jesus later here where, where Jesus is really into this. He's really like, this, he's, a, he's a 12 year old and he likes church and he's really into it. And so I, I don't get the picture that when Joseph and Mary said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, how about, you know, we, we grab a couple donkeys and uh, you grab your backpack and we walk to San Antonio from Austin. I, I, he did not say, ah. He said, okay, let's go. I can't wait. It's like the dream kid. Any of you have kids like that? I mean, I hear stories. I just talked to a family here this morning coming into church, and we talked about kids, and they said, my kid's been so excited to come to church here. And we love that. That's success. We love seeing that. So I, I want you, by a show of hands, tell me, have you ever had a child, if you, have, if you have kids, okay? Or maybe if you've observed kids, nieces, nephews, whoever, ever seen a child, whether it's yours or someone else's, who's so excited about church, they're talking about it like a few days ahead of time, and they get out of bed, and maybe they get you out of bed, and they get you into the car, and they, and they maybe like run to the door and they're smiling. Anyone ever seen a kid do that? Raise your hand. Okay, see, we're about over half. This happens. Some of your kids have done this here. They run in with their Bibles. They run in all, all happy. They have their new shark shoes on. They're coming in to see Jesus at church. Now, that, that, that's good. That's the easy part. What if your kid isn't like that? Then what do you do? Here's some really good guidance. This is, uh, this is from a blog, and, and, and this is about kids who, who aren't as interested in church as Jesus, and maybe they say it's boring, and maybe they say it's not the right music, or they say this, the message is too long, or it's just a bunch of old, boring people, you know, whatever they want to, right? Whatever kids want to say, and they're, they, they want to sleep in, they, want, they need to go to work, they, they ought to hang out with their friends, okay? What do you do as a parent when your kid is a believer, they're a Christian, but they're resisting? Okay, here's some really helpful advice. I'm going to read this. For kids who have their hearts in the right place with Jesus but would rather do other things, there is likely a, listen, a schedule issue. If they would rather sleep, have you overscheduled them to the point that they desperately need rejuvenation? If they would rather see friends, have you allowed for enough social time during the week? The list could go on, but the key point is that everyone needs time to breathe. If your list of required activities during the week leaves your kids feeling like the only optional activity they can clear to make time for themselves is Sunday morning, their schedule may need to be revisited. I think that's really wise. And that's telling us that, that kids' interest in church on Sunday mornings isn't a kid problem, it's a family problem. And it's not, a, it's not a Sunday morning problem. It's a Saturday night problem and a Thursday afternoon problem, right? That's what it's saying. It's a, it's a schedule issue. So what, is, what does, you know, Monday through Saturday look like? 
as you're getting ready for Sunday morning. That's what the blog is saying. Now, um, I have something way better for you than wise advice today. I have the solution to the entire solution to the problem, and it's right here, right in front of us, and it's this. Jesus. The solution to that problem is giving the problem to Jesus, and particularly what we have before us today is a 12-year-old Jesus. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's look at this 12-year-old Jesus. This 12-year-old Jesus was the perfect church attender, and that's pretty good for a 12-year-old. Gets into college, he's still the perfect church attender. Nobody attends church perfectly in college. I don't care what they tell you, they're lying. He's the perfect church attendant. And not just in quantity, list every, every time they go to, but in quality. Jesus loved going to church. He loved it, even as a 12-year-old. He loved it. He will, he'll, he'll later in this episode say to his parents, I just have to be there. I just, I have to be in church. He loves being there. He, he, why is he there? Because Jesus in church hears his father's voice in ways that he doesn't hear when he's alone with his father on the mountain. Because it's being read and it's being preached by rabbis and it's being, it's being sung in songs and, and psalms and he, and he hears the scriptures being read to him about him. Things happen there that don't even for Jesus happen elsewhere. He gets to, to pray with fellow believers, taking needs to God. This is Jesus in church and why he loves it. So he's the perfect church attender. Now here's the good news. Because he's Jesus and because he's your Savior, you have perfect church attendance. Both quantity and quality because of this 12-year-old Jesus. Jesus. When God looks at you, he says, man, they've never missed a Sunday. And you're like, whoa. I mean, I've even been late for my own church, so we're all in this boat, okay? Um, he, but he doesn't see that because Jesus is the perfect church attender. And when you're there with half of a heart, and yeah, you're upset, and you're looking across the aisle, you're, you're coveting the, uh, the nice dress that the other, what, what, right? All that stuff happens here. That, that, God doesn't see that because the, the Jesus is perfect in church for us. Isn't that amazing as our Savior? And so God credits all of his perfect attendance uh, to your account. Now, if that isn't enough, there's the blood. So get a little graphic now. Hang with me. Not too bad. There's the blood. What festival were Mary and Joseph and Jesus going to Jerusalem to celebrate? What was it? The Passover. Where did the Passover come from? It was the 10th plague Back in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, it was the 10th plague in, in the nation of Egypt that God sent to show he was more powerful than King Pharaoh and to rescue his people, the Israelites, from slavery in Egypt. None of the nine plagues convinced Pharaoh that, that he should do this, but the 10th plague was the biggie. The 10th plague was the Passover. In the 10th plague, God said this to his people Israel and told them to tell everyone in Egypt. I'm going to send the angel of death, and the angel of death will come to the household of every person who lives here, slave, master, doesn't matter who you are, every person, and all firstborn will die. Unless you take a lamb without defect, not a broken leg, not the wrong color, not a bad behaving lamb, the, your, your prized lamb slit its throat. And then take that blood and you splash it on the doorpost of your house. Then, when the angel of death comes and sees that blood of that lamb, they will pass over your house and your firstborn will live. Anyone who does that, Israel, Egyptian, who you, uh, that's my promise. And what was God saying? God was saying, this is, this is meant to be, a, so, so you understand, this is a saving act of God. This is not you, Israelites, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and saying, let's think positively and let's escape slavery. It's not happening. You can't. But as an act of God, I'm telling you, I am rescuing you. I am redeeming you without your help. And then that Passover became a sign 
for the church, and for believers in generations to come through the Old Testament into the New Testament. The Passover became a sign saying, watch for the blood. Watch for the blood of the real Passover lamb of God, His own Son, whose innocent, perfect blood will pay for all of our sins when He dies on the cross. So, 12-year-old Jesus is at the temple. And what does he see at, at the temple during the Passover? Lambs. And what's happening to the lambs? Blood. And Jesus' eternal conversations with his Father in heaven. And all the Bible stories that his mom read him when he could sit on her lap about the 10th plague and the Passover lambs. And there's the 12 year old Jesus in church seeing the blood from the slit throats of the Passover lambs, his blood his sacrifice for you. For every sinner, for every slacker, for every church skipper, for every, every sneaker. Sneakers are the people who come in during the second song and they try to sneak in the back row, okay? <laughs> for every speaker, pastor standing up here thinking, I've never been late to church. I, and like I said, I was to my own service once. So, right, we're, all, we're all in this together. What counts is that we're here. But what what's really counts is that your heart is a heart that understands that Jesus loves being here, and he loves that you're here too. And he made it all good. Your church attendance in my, on my computer does not look the same as your church attendance in God's book. Because on my computer, there's missing Sundays. That's okay. But in God's, there's none. You are the perfect, <laughs> you're the perfect worshiper and church attender because of Jesus. And I tell you what, he, Jesus loves it. He meets you here. He meets you here. He loves being in church. Right? As a 12-year-old, he loved being in church. So what's going to happen? Just like Jesus loved church because he knew there were things that were going to happen there that did not happen somewhere else. He loves doing that for you here. There are things that happen to, to you here in church that do not happen on the golf course, do not happen at the lake, and do not happen at St. Mattress listening to Pastor Pillow. Okay, there's things that happen here because Jesus is here and he loves being here. To your kids that don't happen to your kids, playing video games, or sleeping in, or, at, or, or, or off at the lake, that, that, that here right now there's things happening here as they're being taught God's Word that, that do not happen anywhere else because of the surroundings and the world. They're here. And there's things that happen here on Sundays when we as a church celebrate Holy Communion together that don't happen anywhere else. It's the blood. It's Jesus' blood. And He says, I give it for you. You're forgiven. You're free. Now worship me like it. That's how Jesus' family communicates with the church. Now I'm going to show you how they communicate with each other. And, uh, and, and this is really powerful. And uh, so I want to read these verses here about how Jesus' family communicates with each other. Okay, so they are, they are at the festival. And now it says, the Bible says this. This is chapter, uh, verse 43. After the festival was over, while Jesus' parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Uh-oh. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Now, this does not make them bad parents. Um, I think my wife lost our sons a few times when they were growing up, and it uh, doesn't make her a bad mom. Uh, Mary, Mary wasn't a bad mom. Why? Because... The, the family clans traveled together, and all the cousins would be in one caravan, and right? And so they, it just, they've done it many times. They, they'll do it again. It's so it, it's not like they were being bad parents. Um, so they began looking for him among their relatives and friends, and when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem 
to look for him. After three days, they found him. See, so communication blunders happen even to Jesus' family. They happen to ours, mine, yours, even Jesus' family. Here, what's important is how do they respond? And there's, there's three ways I want to show you in here how they respond. They listen and understand each other. They help each other. And they slow down and they share. So I'm going to give you those three points as we finish up here, finish the story, those three points. They listen and understand. Um, they help each other. And they slow down and share. So I want to start here, and I'm going to go back to the book of Proverbs and read you from the Bible, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13, which says this, to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. So it says, Proverbs 18, 13, to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. In other words, knowing all the answers isn't always the best. Here's something better, knowing the right questions. Because what happens when you know the right questions, you encourage dialogue and you encourage understanding, and it's not a statement of pride, it's not a place of pride. It says, I, I know everything that's going on. You're teachable, you're learnable. You say, oh, let, let me understand this. And that's what happened with, with Jesus and with his mother Mary. Um, this is really interesting, less questioning and listening and understanding. Um, the Bible says in, in verse 46 here, when Mary and Joseph went back and they found Jesus at the temple, the Bible tells us what was happening. It says this, Jesus was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. This is the Son of God who knows everything, and he's asking questions. Why? For their good to help, remember what we said from Ephesians earlier, to benefit those who listen? He's listening. Even, even Jesus needs to listen and does it well. And then later, Mary listens. They get back, and the Bible tells us here that she, when she found Jesus, um, she asked him questions about his whereabouts. She didn't just m jump off to assumptions. She asked him, oh, honey, what's going on? Where, where, where have you been? She asked. She listens, right? So, Seek first to understand before being understood. That's what they're practicing, family of Jesus. All right, number two. We're going to read this verse together. Um, this is from Ephesians 4, and this is about helping. Okay, so let's read this. Everyone together. If you read it, it means you agree with it. It's my tricky way of getting you to agree with it. Okay, let's read. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So phase one of communication is listening. Phase two is responding. I'll tell you, you're going to be better at phase two if you're better at phase one. If you're a better listener, you're going to be a better responder. And then what does a healthy response look like? What does communication look like? No unwholesome dirty words, cutting sarcasm, okay? No unwholesome talk, but rather what is helpful. How can I speak in a way that is helpful for the other person? You know, as I've learned to do this better, and I'm not perfect at it, but I'm, I think I'm getting better. I've learned that s slowing down is really important. Like, like not, not responding off the cuff. Like, I don't fire an email back right away at emails I get now that make me upset. I put that on hold, right? So um, you can't always do that in a conversation, but trust me, you can do it more than you think you can, right? You're having an argument with a family member. Hey, I'm, I'm so sorry. Can we take a break and we'll talk about this more in an hour? It, it, tomorrow? Can we? Can we? I'll, I'll, I'll have something better to say. I just, but why can't you say that? And agree that that's the case. And so, uh, praying, God, give me the words. What, what should be the words here, right? Going to others, ask you. I go to my coach. I go to other friends. What would you say here? This person said this. This person emailed this. I'm not sure. How should I respond? How should I? And, and involve others. Go to God's Word and let God speak to you through His Word and, and just take some time, reflect, meditate, pray, and, uh, and it comes back. And then you lovingly share, okay? Then lovingly share. 
So um, you don't have to lie, you don't have to cover it up, but you can share in a loving way. And that, that communication actually happened between Jesus and his mother. Um, so, so listen, they come back, she finds him um, in, in, at the temple. Son, why have you treated like, us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. She, ser- she shares openly her feelings. We've been anxious about you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? That's where he says, I love this. I had to be here. I had to be in my father's house. All right, last one. Uh, it, it has to do with slowness as well, but what happens during slowness? So let's read this verse together. James 1, verse 19. Okay, read it with me. My dear brothers, Jesus' mom has to process this. Take it, slow slow down. And so this even says this in scriptures here. She's, She's processing this. And it says that she treasured all these things in her heart. She needs to put the pieces together and, and wonder what's going on here, right? And compare Jesus' destiny to die to her own dreams for him to give her grandchildren. She, got, she, she needs to be slow, and, and, he, and Jesus needs to let her process it, give her the time to process it. And then Jesus himself needs time. It says, um, and Jesus grew in favor with God and man. That's the last verse, verse 52. Jesus Jesus grew. So you have this family, and they're growing without grudges. Jesus is growing um, emotionally, intellectually, physically. So parents, moms, dads, let your kids grow. There's, they're going to be in seasons. They're going to be in phases. They're going to be in ages where you're thinking, ah, oh, if they'd only listen. Um, be patient and full of grace like God is for us. And remember that Jesus' blood was shed for them too. For, they're forgiven. And teens, be patient with your parents. I know sometimes they act like they know everything, but if you ask them, they'll tell you they don't. And they need processing time, and they need to understand as you're growing up, how you're moving out of the house, you're going off to high school or college, and this makes them concerned because they love you so much. So, so give them understanding and time. And when we all do that, family communication with each other, with the church, we all grow, and we all get past grudges, and we all build each other up. Amen.